So there's this issue, this conspiracy, if you will, that nobody seems to be talking about. And I think it's time that somebody did. Look, here are six images of some cars, and I have a very simple question for you. Which three are the ugliest? Beauty is subjective and all, by all means, but I think we can all agree that these three here are just ugly. Full stop. Now I have a similar question for you. Which of those cars do you think are electric? Because I bet that you got the same answer. Electric cars. Consider full electric cars. Their power comes from coal. Electric cars are not going to save the world. It's not going to tie your trailer. These look like perfectly good cars. Why are you shredding them up? Costing taxpayers billions of dollars and it's primarily going to very high. This is oil. It's the stuff that's used to make plastic, generate electricity, but most importantly, it's the stuff that's used to drive cars. This is a $600 million super yacht owned by a man who makes money from selling oil. And this is a mansion in France owned by siblings who sell cars that use oil. Together, the industries that they work in are worth a cumulative $7.8 trillion, which is a lot of money. A lot of money that you'll do anything not to lose. In the 90s, GM made this electric car called the EV1, and it was an instant hit. You had celebrities talking about it and driving them, and it was a generally cool car. How does it work? I said, well, this is amazing. What you do is with this electric car, Dave, you put the key in, mm -hmm. and you turn it. Wow. And then there's this thing on the floor called the pedal. A pedal. <laughs> and what you do is, you press on that, and believe it or not, that sucker goes. That really? thing will take you down the PCH so fast you can get a ticket. It had this sleek, futuristic vibe with these new digital displays. And literally tens of thousands of people wanted one. There was an enormous waiting list, and everybody thought it would be the car that would change the world. But there was a catch. You couldn't actually buy the car. You could only rent it. And when your lease expired, you had to give your EV1 back to GM. And then they just destroyed every last one. What? A car company just made a product so successful that it could have changed the world. It could have made them billions of dollars and cemented their position as the world leaders in the electric car industry. But they just decided to end it. Just like that. Ford killed off their EV, the Think City as well claiming that the bottom line is we don't believe that this is the future of environmental transport for the mass market. We have given electric our best shot. And then they too shut their doors, which apparently was a business decision based on the market. Why would you spend $123 million developing something and then just stop a few years later? That doesn't seem to make sense. On to two, we hit our projections, which brings us to the end of phase one. So we are stopping production. Why would a company stop producing a product after they had literally just proved it was successful? If phase one was a success, why didn't they begin phase two? Let's go back to our six cars. These three here are electric, and these are all combustion. These two are Renaults, these two are Hondas, and these ones are BMWs. In their respective pairs, they were all produced in the same year and cost the same amount to buy. And yet, for some reason, the EVs are just so much worse. They are slow and ugly and horrible, and they don't even look like cars. So, what happened? We can clearly see that these companies can make really nice, practical cars. It's not like they're incapable, but the second it came to making an electric one, it's like they weren't even trying at all. And that's what this video is about. Electric vehicles were built to be slow, to be ugly, because I want to expose the unfortunate truth that electric cars were built to fail. Before we get too deep into this, I want to talk about oil for a little. Oil is a five trillion dollar industry, one that has been around forever, but now there's this general consensus that oil is bad, that oil and global warming are killing the turtles. Today, oil is demonized, nobody wants anything to do with it because it's a fuel of the past. Oil supplies are literally going to run out in the next few decades. Oil is dead, and everyone knows it. So how does it make sense that the industry is getting richer? This is Donald Trump. He's a politician, and politics is a game, and like any game, it's pay to win. Very pay to win. My father gave me a small loan of a million dollars. Trump's 2016 campaign cost $400 million, some of which comes from very large, very wealthy oil companies. 
loans. Some individual CEOs forked out seven-figure checks to do their part. 1.7 million from Kelsey Warren, 1 million from Harold Hamm and Robert Murray, along with many other smaller donations which brought Trump's oil funding to $112 million in 2020 and even more in 2016. Because these companies know that by donating to a political party, they are buying favorable treatment later on down the line. They get special treatment and most relevant laws passed will conveniently favor oil. The United States will withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord. So in 2016, Trump gets elected. And in order to say thank you to his good friends in Big Oil, he decides to make their lives a little easier. $25 billion easier. In his time in office, the Trump administration managed to roll back 127 environmental laws that enabled the oil sector to keep polluting and profiting. On top of that, they changed numerous tax laws, including the lowering of the corporate tax rate, large oil subsidies, CEO compensation, and dodgy offshore transaction taxes to bring earnings back into the country, which end up incentivizing large companies to abuse loopholes. Collectively, these changes mean that in the next decade, four oil companies alone will benefit by $14.7 billion. Now, I'm no economist, I'm not going to claim I understand the nitty gritty of all of these changes, but what I do understand is that is a lot of commas. Look at this pie chart. It shows how oil is used around the globe. Almost half of the world's oil is used in the automotive industry. So if all cars become electric, that would mean big oil would lose a lot of money. Money that they will do anything they can to keep. And the way you do just that is by stopping EVs from hitting the market. And it might be counterintuitive at first, but the car industry doesn't want EVs to become popular either. Developing battery tech is very expensive. Ford spent $123 million on their EV, and VM was close at a half a billion. Similarly, the high cost of manufacturing batteries is currently a lot higher than a combustion engine, so profit margins are lowered. And at the end of the day, businesses are there to make money. Art Garner, a spokesman for Honda, said it best, nobody makes money on EVs. But that's only half the story, because these car companies have been around for a really, really long time, and in that time period they have only ever made internal combustion engines. It's what they're known for, it's what they can do well. EVs are a completely different product and they have no expertise in that field. There is no guarantee that these companies will survive the transition. EVs could make some of these car companies completely obsolete. Think of Blockbuster and Blackberry and MySpace. Some new product came along, something different, something better, and it killed them. Car companies are afraid that they will be next. So you have these two enormous industries that don't want EVs, but how do they stop the technology from advancing? How do they stop EVs from becoming mainstream? Demand. If you can kill the demand, if you can make the consumers not want to purchase EVs in the first place, you can justify not investing in the technology because you can claim that there is no market for it. If nobody wants an EV, why make one? So the key is to limit demand, and you do this in two ways. Make really bad, and I mean really bad electric cars, while at the same time you generate misinformation that scares consumers away from EVs. We already touched on manufacturers making them ugly, but I don't think you understand just how little they were trying. This is Walter Baker, the founder of the Baker Motor Vehicle Company, the largest electric car manufacturer at the turn of the 20th century. The electric cars he made were really good. They were incredible. Look at the inside-driven coupe, for example. It had a range of 100 miles. Comparatively, the Renault Twizy, that mobility scooter of a car from earlier, only had a range of just 56. Something tells me that math doesn't quite add up. In a hundred years, battery technology has literally gotten twice as bad. And speed too. Walter Baker actually set the land speed record with an electric car called the Torpedo. It was the first vehicle to ever travel a hundred miles per hour. And I hate to pick on the Twizy again, but it can only go 28 miles per hour. So, somewhere along the line, something changed. We had these innovative EVs that were really good back in the day, and yet a century later, the cars have gotten uglier, slower, and now have far less range. No wonder people say EVs are bad. No wonder they are ridiculed for being slow and horrible, because they are. Who in their right mind would actually buy a car that can barely drive to the shops and back? It's not that the technology isn't there or that the battery tech isn't good enough yet. The tech was there a hundred years ago. For reference, this is what a camera looked like a hundred years ago and this is what one looks like today. And this one can instantly talk to any other device anywhere in the world and play games and stream movies. It can send things through the air and has more processing power than the entirety of the 80s. This is what a hundred years of development looks like. 
This was an EV a hundred years ago. This is one now. 